Hello, everyone. Welcome to Kryptonized. My host, my co-host, Amanda Whitcroft, and I are proud to bring on to our show Natalie Brunel, who's just left her illustrious career, took a big risk, and is now out on in her in on her own, uh, and is going to talk about what she's doing. So, with that, before we jump in. Natalie, can you give us just a few you know, moments about uh, your career? Uh, I know it's probably hard to condense into you know, 30 seconds or less, but please give it a try. Sure. Thanks so much for having me. So my name is Natalie Brunel. I am a podcast host in the Bitcoin space. I host Coin Stories. And uh, for the last 10 plus years, I was a television broadcast news journalist covering everything from breaking news to uh, investigative stories. I've traveled around the country covering news for legacy TV media. And uh, before that, you know, I have an immigration story. I was born in Poland, grew up outside Chicago, and then have just traveled all over uh, for work. And I'm super excited to dedicate my new career to, to Bitcoin. Excellent. And did you really just quit your job as a news reporter for Spectrum just to jump fully into the crypto space? Correct. Yes, I did. <laughs> what made you want to make that leap? Um, you know, if you would have told me that I, I'd be doing this like a year ago, I probably wouldn't have believed you. I've just been so deep down the rabbit hole getting really passionate about the space and educating people about why our system is sort of fundamentally broken and how we can connect the dots with with how money has affected all of these problems in society that I've been covering for the last 10 years, everything from homelessness to public corruption to, um, I mean, you name it. There's so many issues with, with our... Um, with our country right now and the cost of education and housing. Natalie Brunel has the latest on the case from outside the courthouse. According to U.S. attorney filings, this was a well-oiled quid pro quo machine. Now, Wizar made his first court appearance remotely and his sister posted his $100,000 bond. At the same time, his colleagues were voting unanimously to suspend him from city council. So I started to connect the dots and I felt like I could actually do more good in this space. I started the podcast. That took off and running. It grew very, very quickly. And I felt like I I wasn't kind of fulfilling my calling anymore. I, I've been doing the same thing for the last 10 plus years. And, you know, there's only so many times you can cover the next election or the homeless crisis once again. And I just felt like I was sort of on this hamster wheel in a way. And I wanted to do more good. And I felt like I could do some good by educating people about about fiat and government money and printing and inflation and use that as sort of a value proposition for why they should maybe think about Bitcoin. Yeah. And how, how did coin, coin stories happen or come to be? When did you start that? Yeah, so I actually have had um, I've been podcasting since 2018 alongside my reporting career. So Prior to Coin Stories, I actually, my podcast was called Career Stories, and I've always been fascinated by origin stories and how people got to be where they are and how they achieved success or overcame obstacles. So um, if you've heard of the podcast, How I Built This with Guy Raz, I basically wanted to recreate that, but for people within the media landscape who, you know, they didn't necessarily build businesses like Southwest Airlines, but they are businesses themselves. They're maybe social media personalities or journalists or fitness trainers or whatever it is. Uh, So I would interview people and uh, about their lives and their journeys and their careers. And then once I got super passionate about the Bitcoin and finance space, I just shifted gears and sort of spun that podcast off and focused solely on people that had really big followings and were thought leaders within Bitcoin and crypto. Um, and it's been fascinating because I've gotten a chance to, to learn from them and go even deeper down the rabbit hole. Yeah. And what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from your guests since starting this podcast? Oh, gosh, so many. I mean, a lot of them were really, really successful in their careers prior to discovering Bitcoin. You know, everything from investment and finance to accounting to Um, you know, investing in all these different like companies as an angel investor. And I just think that everyone has come to the same conclusion that they wanted their their money to go a long way. And they felt like um, everything around them was getting more and more expensive and the the purchasing power of the dollar was decreasing. And there was no way out until when you learn about Bitcoin, it's kind of this, I think that's why people make fun of it is, oh, it's so hopeful. And it's this like unicorn, you know, community of people that think everything's going to be solved by Bitcoin. But 
we feel that way, I think, because prior to learning about Bitcoin, what is the solution? What is the solution to the booms and bust cycles, these business cycles that the Fed sort of creates, um, where essentially you're either going toward inflation on, in, on one side or you're going to have a massive crash that's going to hurt a lot of people on the other. And so I think Bitcoin kind of offers this ability to equalize the system again, to have sound money at the base layer of our economy and allow the free markets to function again, which we haven't seen for so long. Um, so I, yeah, I learned a lot from them and, and I just get, get more and more passionate the more that I talk to people in this space. I have trouble making this leap. And uh, I know we've talked before about this, but you know, you're in the news reporting, you're into politics, you're doing all this stuff on the side, and then you start, suddenly discover Bitcoin and you got to get excited about it. And there's not a lot of women in the space. There's more and more coming, and I know you're helping with that. But when was it that you realized, you know, you've got to get, you got to get invested in Bitcoin and you got to get interested in, in becoming a, a member of the space? Um, so I first invested in Bitcoin in 2017, and I kind of bought very naively and ignorantly. I didn't do a lot of homework. I just, um, I had a community of people who were working in the space or owned some crypto. Um, and I was just curious. I thought, you know, what is this? It's interesting. It's going up. But I just, I didn't read the literature. I didn't go, you know, diving through all the resources online yet. So I'm, I'm happy that I bought. And I think once you do buy, you know, some of the people I've interviewed have said, if you just buy a little, all of a sudden you have an incentive to pay attention, right? Even if it's just a couple dollars worth, all of a sudden you start tracking the price. You want to learn a little bit more about it. And that's sort of what happened to me. But I was pretty brave. Like I put in a significant chunk of money uh, at the time, I think. And I think Bitcoin only cost 7,000 uh, when I entered. And um, yeah, and then I just started learning more. And, and really the the impetus for me going down the rabbit hole was someone recommended the Bitcoin standard. And I ended up reading that like three times. I think everyone should read that. I learned so much about the history of money and uh, and why, why Bitcoin um, functions so well and why it was programmed the way it was. And I, yeah, I became very, very inspired. And, and so, yeah, 2017 to now has been such a journey. I've learned a lot. Yeah, and it certainly sounds like you know the history of money a lot. So I'm curious to ask you, you know, what is the problem with our central banks and how does Bitcoin fix that? Yeah, so I think a lot of people don't realize that when you have a central bank that expands the money supply um, and essentially debases our currency and makes the dollars worth less, that that it, uh, contributes to this wealth inequality that we see. And I, th I think that those narratives are so fascinating today, you know, that people latch on to of like tax the rich, you know, and, and we have just like the haves and the have nots in this country. And people don't realize that if you ma manipulate the money system, if you artificially lower interest rates, if you provide easy access to money to the big banks and corporations, you're just exacerbating the problem. And that's not capitalism. That's not free markets. That's what a lot of you know Austrian economists in this space call crony capitalism. You're basically pooling the money at the top, and the people who are the politicians and want to get reelected and you know promise people the free lunch, they're not affected by it. The big corporations and the people with all the money who are carrying you know assets and have a ton of real estate, they're not affected by it. But the little guy is, and you know I spent the last ten plus years as a reporter interviewing the little guy every single day, interviewing. Many people from, you know, disenfranchised communities and people who are just trying to make it. And I see my parents in those people like they came here with nothing from a communist country where they didn't have a lot of freedom. They just wanted to make it and give their kids a better life. And the system makes it harder and harder to do so when everything just gets more and more expensive and the system suddenly feels rigged against you that no matter how hard you work, you're just going to have to keep on working and you can't build that sense of general generational wealth unless you risk your money or know how to, you know, carefully invest it, maybe hire a portfolio manager or something. It's not, you can't just put your money away in the bank and just step aside and not worry about it and be able to plan for your future. And I think Bitcoin kind of offers that, that solution, that life raft to be able to say, okay, yes, people view it as risky and it is volatile right now, but look at the 12 year chart. Anyone that has bought Bitcoin and held it for four plus years has not lost money. They are in the green. They have made money. And if you put your money away in Chase Bank, Wells Fargo, you're going to get, what, 0.005% yield, and you're actually losing money based on inflation. 
Maybe you put it in stocks and mutual funds, maybe you make 7% or so. But I mean, Bitcoin is the best performing asset of the last 10 years. So, you know, for people to at least allocate 1% to 5%, I think that's a pretty smart decision at this point based on its history. And, you know, ultimately it comes down to a personal decision, no financial advice. But I just think that Bitcoin offers a chance, again, to sort of return us to that sense of hard money that cannot be inflated by a central bank, the government is not involved in these transactions, no third parties involved in these transactions, and the supply is fixed, meaning that you can't steal people's money through inflation. Mm-hmm. You, you sound like a Bitcoin maximalist. Is that true? Um, you know, I, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist in the sense that I believe that that could be our reserve currency. And I think it's the technology that's really proven itself over time. And I love that it's truly decentralized. I would love to learn more about some of the other projects happening in this space. But, you know, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And so I would I can't come out there and say, oh, I believe in you know, this coin or that coin, um, because frankly, I I have a lot of questions. Like, is it centralized? What is the supply? Can it be inflated? Who's behind it? You know, I worry that some of these altcoins, maybe not all of them, but I just worry that some of them are sort of the the musical chairs kind of scheme where some people are going to throw a bunch of money in when it doesn't cost even a penny, right? And they make this massive return and then they sell and someone's going to lose money. Um, and, and so that makes me really worried. I think that some of them will survive and have great um, you know, value propositions and use cases. But I also think a lot won't. And I sort of see the whole cryptocurrency space almost like um, the car. I, someone compared this to, to the car industry to me once where they talked about how there's been like 2000 car companies that have you know been created. But we only know of what, like 10 car brands. Right. So I think A lot will fall by the wayside. Some will rise to the top. But I truly believe in Bitcoin. So like I I speak about Bitcoin and I educate about Bitcoin because I also think it's a great entry point into crypto. Do you have any favorite books about Bitcoin? Are there are there any books that you would recommend to beginners starting their journey in in Bitcoin? Yeah. So, I mean, my favorite book is Bitcoin Standard. I've read it multiple times. Um, I think that Saifedean Amos is brilliant. I loved interviewing him. And he just came out with his second book, The Fiat Standard, which goes even deeper. And one of my favorite things about his books is just kind of connecting the dots, not just with the, the, the money system and what's broken in it, but how it actually has impacted like our day-to-day lives um, with regards to time preference and like how we view the future and the decisions we make in our everyday lives. And he touches on things like morality and how if you think about the future, you can plan for your future and not worry about your money being debased. You pr- you probably make decisions um, in your communities that are more, uh, they, they contribute to more human flourishing, cooperation, morality, because uh, you're not discounting the future because you're not, you're not worried about losing all your money. All right. I want to switch gears here just a little bit uh, and talk about the future. Uh, Actually, a little bit of a past first. Now, you run a podcast. You've been a journalist. What has been your favorite either guest or story from a guest in the crypto industry thus far? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, You've told me you've had some fun guests, some interesting guests and ones that you yeah, I mean, I happy really, to get. I literally can't choose because it's like they're so great. I mean, I've really loved um, – I love Preston Pish. My Michael Saylor interview was phenomenal. I love talking to Peter Schiff even though I know he's a gold bug, but I actually think he's brilliant when it comes to just economics um, and how our government works and helping helping share that message. Um, Lynn Alden was phenomenal. I think she's so brilliant and a thought leader that we're really lucky to have. Um, and then I, I interviewed VJ, who's the author of The Bullish Case for Bitcoin yesterday. He was phenomenal. I I mean, I can't really choose one, I guess. I think they've all been super, super interesting. I actually really liked um, Jason Williams' story. I don't know if you guys know it, but he came from this really interesting background where it's like, immigrant story. Um, and then he went to medical school and he left medical school to basically create like a, a um, like a, a, an urgent care center. And, and it was, it spread across the country. There's like almost as many of them as like a Starbucks. And he shifted his career from there into crypto and mining. And like his, all these journeys are so different and unique and I've learned a lot from them. Okay. And then when uh, you speak to these guests, what is it that you're trying to accomplish with the podcast? What is it that you're, you're trying to do? Are you Are trying to educate yourself? Are you trying to educate other people? All of the above. What's the purpose of the podcast? 
Um, so for me, like I mentioned before, I just love origin stories. I like to understand where someone comes from and how they got to be where they are. I'm, I'm just like a biography, you know, nerd. And so I like to hear what brought someone to the point of learning about Bitcoin and becoming very convicted in Bitcoin. And, um, and I chose these people basically because when I was going down the rabbit hole, these were the biggest thought leaders. These were the people who had the biggest followings. Many of them had written books. They were sort of the experts in the space. So I wanted to know how they became experts, um, what led them down this journey and why they really believe in it. So I think, I think for a lot of people that maybe come into the space and they see these names and they're all, they have huge followings, or maybe they see a book. I'm one of those people that wants to know like, well, who is that guy? Like, where did he come from? How did he discover Bitcoin? So, you know, for me, it's like a selfish journey for me in the sense that I genuinely want to learn this information. But if other people, I, I want, I hopefully want other people to also get something out of it where they learn about that person and maybe understand why they believe in Bitcoin as well. Yeah. Do you think Bitcoin is receiving fair press from your larger media companies right now? Uh, no, I, I don't necessarily. I just think that there are a lot of, um, narratives out there that need, that need better homework and research and people who are well-versed in the space. Um, that's also one of the reasons why, you know, I really wanted to leave. Um, I couldn't really be neutral about Bitcoin anymore. I was for a time in my career where I sort of would have the interview with the, you know, economist who's like, Bitcoin's going to die and be hacked and all that. And then I would have the other guy saying, Bitcoin's great. And I just felt like I was almost doing a disservice because after doing so much homework, I was basically, you know, propping up people or adding them to my story who had the counter argument, but they didn't really not necessarily know a ton about Bitcoin. And they were just, they, they were, they had the counter argument because they had just been on the other side for so long and they were deep in the trenches of a different style of economics or in the old system or in the legacy banking or gold or whatnot. So, um, yeah, I just, I felt like I had to contribute in some way. And do you, do you think the problem of disinformation in our news currently is going to improve in the future? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, it's definitely scary, the silos that we live in with regards to media, right? Um, I I have noticed that with the decentralization of media, just like finance, that people are finding personalities and voices that they agree with um, and that echo what they already think or feel. They're kind of rising quicker than sort of the, the mainstream voices and so I think that that's really interesting, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, today I look at the landscape and people claim to want sort of the neutral news and, and something that has no bias, but when those outlets are created, they fail pretty quickly and no one watches them. And it seems like we tend to go toward the, the polarizing network, you know, media platforms. And uh, I don't know. I mean, that's why I, I'm also excited to be part of sort of the decentralized nature and just go out on my own, because then I'm not held to someone else's opinion. And you know what? I, I have beliefs on both sides. I'm sort of in the, in the gray area. And I don't think that everyone has to be pinned down as red or blue or this or that. I think we have a lot more in common than we than we think and what the media puts out there. And, um, yeah, I just, it's sad that we live in such a polarized time where some of these narratives get picked up on one side and they just like run with it in, in, in mm -hmm. mainstream news. So one of the questions I have, uh, for you, Natalie, is at this point, what would it take for you to sell your Bitcoin? What would it take? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't sell my Bitcoin. Um, what would it take? Ever? If it got to 500,000, you wouldn't sell it? No, because especially at 500,000, that means like it's pretty successful, right? I would, I would be more apt to borrow against it. I mean, right now I'm in, I'm in the position where I'm going to work my butt off to keep buying Bitcoin and I have enough to live on, but everything else I'm just, I'm putting into Bitcoin, I'm holding and I'm believing in this system and um, I wouldn't, there, I wouldn't sell my Bitcoin. There's nothing that would make me sell it right now. Wow. Oh, yeah. Because if wow. it went off, then then clearly it's successful. And if it crashed down to two thousand, like why would I sell? Why would I sell it? <laughs> it's worthless anyway. No, yeah, I'd buy more. Yeah. Given the history of it, why would you why would you sell at that point? But 
Let me tell you something. If Bitcoin went to 500,000 tomorrow, I'd be first in line to sell it. I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah. Look, yeah. if I had here, would you buy it? Would you buy it from me if it were five hundred thousand? I was selling. <laughs> well, here's what I would say: <laughs> If I was one of those people that had like a thousand Bitcoin, then sure, I might cash out a couple Bitcoins and buy something fun. Um, but I don't have enough to to just to sell and get rid of one. Because what if that five hundred thousand dollars turns into one point five million? You know, <laughs> you start you start weighing it. You're like, oh, well. With that, let's go to the lightning round then. So these are just quick answers. We've had some guests, you know, spend five minutes on these uh, on these answers. So we're just looking for quick answers, okay? Okay. And then okay. Amanda will wrap everything up for us. Um, Bitcoin or Ethereum? I think I know the answer. Bitcoin. Is, <laughs> if we elected a president of crypto, would it be Elon Musk or Jack Dorsey? Jack Dorsey. What is the price of Bitcoin on December 31st, 2021? Take out your crystal ball. Um, a hundred thousand. I mean, a little over. Like, so that's not an even, around a hundred thousand. All right, with that, Amanda. What advice would you give people new to the world of Bitcoin? Um, don't be worried if it seems intimidating or overwhelming. Everyone has been at the beginning of that rabbit hole Find people that you relate to and who make the space more welcoming and just dive in and ask all the questions you can. All right. Well, I have to uh, really thank you, Natalie, for coming on board. I know you took a massive risk in your career. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't do that. Um, I don't know how much of a plan you had going into crypto before you did it, uh, but you do have a, a course for women, if I'm not uh, mistaken, and uh, we'll put those that information in the show notes if you want to join natalie and uh, again thank you so much and look forward to seeing you uh in the future uh, especially on twitter you get a lot of engagement on twitter big engagement we'll put her twitter handle in the show notes as well thank you uh, again from amanda and myself thank you natalie for being on the show yeah thank you Natalie. So much for You're having such me a guys. Pioneer. thank you